Hey guys, it's JT Tran, and today I want to address a very unique but very special topic, which is Asian masculinity and Asian manhood. And today I have with me a great guest, William. For those of you who don't know, he is one of my former students turned instructor, but then he retired in order to get married, and I had the great honor of officiating his wedding. Now, the reason I brought William here is because to me, her journey of manhood is something that goes beyond just picking up women. That's very important in you know, today's day and age, having that choice and that selection of who you want in your life. But beyond that, instead of simply getting girls and getting laid and romantically connecting, you look forward to someone that you're going to spend the rest of your life with and what thought processes you need to go through to decide, hey, I'm at that journey of, of manhood. And then, you know, William here is... Right, you're ready to get, you know, become a father, maybe. It's it's in the works. It's in the works, right? And you know, that's not necessarily for me, and maybe that's not for you. But we all go through this journey of trying to define what it is to be an Asian man, especially when you're Asian American. It can be a very sort of you know, confusing subject because you have like the mainstream idea of what it is to be masculine, which is defined by like essentially the white Caucasian male. And, you know, we have our own family and religion and culture. And for those of you, us who are stuck in this sort of mix, you know, what does it mean to be an Asian American male? And why don't you tell them a little bit about your background? Because when I found you, when we met, you were in a unique position that uh, some of our students might be familiar with. Right, okay, this is going way back. Yes, just give them a like, the short right. version. All right, so let's see, so in, I think the mid-2000s, that's when we first met. Mm -hmm. So in the mid-2000s, I was very lonely, very desperate, <laughs> and completely, totally clueless about how to meet girls. Right, and William here works on Wall Street. Right, so it's not like you were uh, some schlub that didn't have a job or anything like that. You were running a podcast, you were doing volunteer work in the Asian American community, you were like working out, doing dance, and you were still ha struggling with women. Right, so like I was kind of living the contradiction sort of because I had on paper a crap ton of um, accolades and, and achievements and all kinds of things working for me in my professional life, my personal life, and also in volunteer and community activities. And but in this one area right. of, of the romance and, and, and anything associated with that, it, I was a complete and total failure. Now, would you say that you, you did like, you had Fallout, what was it, the Fallout podcast, which was like the, at the time, like the number one Asian American downloaded um, political podcast, right? If I remember. It was pretty, it was up there. Yeah. I, I didn't really check the stats that carefully, but yeah. it was up there. Yeah, at the time, um, you were very active in that regards. Like, unconsciously, why were you pursuing that avenue of success? Like, I, I, it's, to me, it seems like you were unconsciously through culture or your family, like, this is what you're supposed to do in order to be a success, to be like a man, right? Well, so I wanted, I always wanted to, to put my free time into some effort, some kind of volunteer effort outside of my profession and outside of my social circle. So I chose to do podcasting and, and exploring different aspects of media and Asian representation in mainstream media. But the real reason, in hindsight now looking so many years later, the real reason why I was digging into all those stories and stereotypes and, and negative this and negative that about Asian people was because I was kind of angry and I was mm -hmm. basically kind of looking for confirmation of that to like say, oh yeah, you know what? This is exactly why no. I'm supposed to be angry about this. <laughs> so like you're the typical angry Asian man. Right, Pretty it's like much. it's a Hollywood's fall. It's a white man's fall. Like Asian girls are selling out. Like I'm sure you, you know, we're familiar with that, and you guys might we're probably familiar with that. Like that, it's everybody else's fault other than myself. And so you internalize this energy, you sublimate it into these pursuits. Like you're saying, you ran like the Fallout podcast. You're in all these sort of pursuits, and then I hate to say this, but once you actually started becoming successful romantically after the boot camp. It was no surprise that your political activism kind of, the anger died, would you? Oh yeah, I just completely just disconnected. Yeah. Once you started like having sex, you no longer cared about the anger. Pretty much, because at that point it's like irrelevant, right? Stereotype this or stereotype that or some negative portrayal of an Asian person here or there, it had absolutely zero impact on what was happening in my personal life 
and, and my romance life. So there was really, so th at that point, then I could see for real in my life, there's no correlation between these two things. Right. Your masculinity, your identity was no longer defined by external, exactly. like Hollywood and the mainstream and these things that made you angry. You could be, like you were previously looking for confirmation of these stereotypes that are holding you down. Now you have the power, like after the boot camp, where you were breaking stereotypes by being who you were and getting the results that you were getting. Exactly. And, and I always thought like, okay, because there are this many you know, negative stereotypes or because there are this many negative movie portrayals, that's why I can't be successful in my personal or my romance life, right? Mm -hmm. But then, you know, in between the time like right before I took your boot camp and like the few months after it when I was like really enjoying myself a mm -hmm. lot, there was no there was no change in the number of like movie portrayals that were yeah. about Asian. Yeah, there were no Jeremy Lins or anything like that back in the day. No change, positive or negative, but yet my life was like so much more fulfilled. Yeah, it was improving. So the only explanation for that that I can that I can tell you is that it's like a matter of acquiring skills from JT, just like raw information about how to do things procedurally, and then using the time which we call beginner's hell to develop it into my own personality. And so the, the combination of that is, is really what, what ultimately got me to where I am right now. Right. So. so previously, I, I showed you a meme of Japanese men was considered masculine back in the day. Okay, they're like bigger, burly, or whatever you want to call it. And then what was considered more attractive to women of today, at least to, to Asian women. And you can see this evolution, or you know, a quote unquote evolution of what it looked like to be an Asian man and what it looks like to be a, an Asian man today. Like, what do you consider like Asian masculinity or like manhood? What does that mean to you? Um. Well, in order for me to answer that, I kind of have to tell you what I thought Asian masculinity was mm -hmm. at the time when we were doing this boot camp uh, coaching right. and stuff. At that time, I actually thought Asian masculinity was defined as effeminate, um, like demure, uh, subservient, and just, just not really just not somebody that you'd want to listen to. Right. right, and you can see that in the meme, and like you're showing like these guys that. Like Kate was saying, she looked at it, I was like, these guys are prettier than she is. And it, it, it looks, like you said, a very kind of effeminate, exactly. at least what it is today. And I think that, you know, it, it's wrong to consider that the, the core identity of Asian males because that's, I think that's been influenced by, by the music industry and, and like if you look back what it was considered um, masculine, I think that's more the core of who we are as Asian men, not what is today seen in K-pop and J-pop and all that. But, but at the time, what I thought was defined as the Asian man is what I just observed in, in mainstream media. But now, so many years later, and, and I am so far detached from picking up girls and attending <laughs> camp and coaching, I'm so far detached, I can tell you, like conclusively for me, Asian masculinity is you. That's it. It's me. Whatever, whatever I wanted. I know that sounds totally very meta, <laughs> totally metaphysical, but it is true. It's just you. You are it. That's it. Okay. There's this old and uh, old sort of tradition in Japan. I'm sure I'm going to butcher the the term. Something called like jinkupu, and other Asian societies have this this transformation of what it means to be a boy into a man. Right. And in Japan, it was at a certain age, I think 14, 15, you were, a boy was given a new name, a, you know, grown up name, given a new haircut, given a man's clothes, and then taken to meet a woman. And so what the boot camps were doing is very similar to that, in that you had this sort of stage name that if you so choose, the handle, and you were allowed to reinvent yourself. You're allowed to reinvent yourself without the fear repercussion of being made fun of. Because let's admit it, like Asian guys trying to be successful at this, a lot of guys make fun of this. Because to them, the idea of Asian masculinity, like you're saying, is effeminate. It's a joke, right? And, and that is true, but when you're getting laid every weekend, you stop caring. <laughs> about it. You just don't care anymore. Yeah. Which is where I was after, like somewhere in the middle of and after beginner's help. Right. And other parts of, of that, that rite of passage, of, of manhood, if you will, was the idea of, of getting a new haircut, 
getting new clothes. And if you remember <laughs> some of our students with the Asian bowl cut or the clothes that they wore, they still wore, like some of you guys get rid of your high school clothes and your high school haircut. It's time to grow up and be a man. And it's just not simply, oh, I'm dressing white. Every Asian culture on some level did that. You, the idea was getting rid of your the toys you had as a boy and getting the, you know, the accoutrements and tools of a man. And then obviously having some sort of sexual or romantic success where you know what it is like to be a woman and to treat a woman. And so we have that in Asian culture and I think that it's an unfortunate part where we sort of lost that or similarly being Asian American, we don't know we have a hard time defi defining what it is to be like an Asian man without these conflicting either negative stereotypes like you were saying, the anger that comes from it, or the idea of like, I must act and be white in order to be successful. And I don't believe that's true either. I don't think speaking up and having confidence, that makes you white. I think that, you know, we as Asians, we did that before. You know, you look at like our, our culture, like Vietnam has, a, you know, very kind of warrior-like culture and the fact that every inch of that, of my motherland is covered in blood, you know, various wars or, you know, China, Taiwan, like we do come from a martial culture, but somewhere along the line, colonialization, that we've lost that. Um, so I think that we need to take that back. We need to stop defining ourselves simply by the ex negative external, you know, things that make us, you know, fill these stereotypes. But at the same time, getting rid of the belief that being confident, talking up, being successful, dating who you want, somehow that makes you white. And I don't think that is absolutely, I don't think that's true at all. I think you can be successful as an Asian man because you're Asian and not in spite of it. So, you're past that part of getting laid. I mean, that's something part of a man's journey, but that's only a small part. You're the part where you decided to be married. You gave me the honor of officiating that. Like, why did you decide to, why did you decide to go from that knight errant to the prince? Why did you decide to go from the guy, the playboy, to someone that, this is the woman I want to be with the rest of my life? So I always had that goal in mind, right? The, my goal from, from the get-go was just to find that one person that I could spend the rest of my life with and just be with her. But I, I kind of knew intuitively, I just didn't know how to describe it in these words as I do now, but at the time I just knew that if I didn't have certain pieces of my life in order and working correctly, then I wouldn't be able to offer a, a, like a full and complete life and be a full and complete spouse to my future wife, which is what I do now. So, mm -hmm. and so like there are multiple pieces in what I believe as, as being a complete man. So there's your profession, there's your family, um, your friends and your personal life, community and volunteer work. And then there's this romance aspect, which yeah. as you know, I was <laughs> completely deficient in. And because that one piece was missing, there was, I always felt there was something missing from my, my whole person. So then after I filled that in, then I feel like, okay, you know what? Now I can be a full person, be a full man. And now I can offer a complete romantic lifetime experience to that one person that I'm going to find who I'm with right now. I think that's beautiful. Um, what would, be, would you consider like a general rule of thumb for a guy to go from playing the field, which you did for a while, to like now it's time to settle down? Like what would you say as a general rule of thumb that they should look out for to say, okay, you know, you slept with X amount of women, now it's time to really look. Oh man, I can only tell you what my decision process right. was. It was just, I, I knew going in that this kind of, like, this kind of lifestyle, it, it's, it's like you could always get something better, right? There's always going to be like the better New York City restaurant that, that does, I don't know, seafood better than, than the other seafood joint or something like that. There's always mm -hmm. going to be something better. So I knew going in that I would have to have just some way to tell myself, okay, you know what, I, I think I got enough now. So now I'm just gonna like look for the right person, but it's really different for everybody. Right. There's no way you could advise some other person how they how they should value that kind of experience. For me, it just happened to be from 2007 until the point where I decided I was gonna settle down with my current, well then girlfriend, but now wife. Mm -hmm. But for another person, maybe it'll take years for that. Or, or maybe for another person, they'll just decide that they don't want that. Uh -huh. But for me, that was just always my, yeah. My goal in mind. 
I think the majority of us, especially Asians, is when they take the boot camp, and like you're saying, you had this destination in mind. You had to take the journey, but your destination was to fall in love with someone and get married. And I think the majority of my students, maybe not to get married, but they want to find someone special. I mean, you know, it's like no one wants to die alone, right? You want someone to spend your day with, like after a hard day's work, you want to be able to come home to somebody, tell her your day, and that you can have this really lasting and fulfilling relationship. Not that every student wants that, you know, some students really do want to play the field, but, you know, the vast majority want a quality girlfriend. There were also miniature goals <laughs> along the way. So like, to build up to that, yes. So like, okay, yes, I, I wanted to be married. I want to have that one person. But there were miniature goals that are not as high and lofty. For example, uh, I want to be able to go into a nightclub and, and make out with a girl there that night that I'm attracted to. Or, or get a same night lay, or, or get a date the next day, or a certain number of dates, or have multiple dates in one day. Like all these little different combinations of things right. that that any guy would want to do, you know. So and isn't it, they're not high and lofty, right. but these were goals that I had. Would you say accomplishing those goals better informed your decision of settling down, and in fact made you a better husband? Yes, one hundred percent. Yes. Okay. So first of all, on the better informing part. Definitely better informed because if you already know what's out there and you've experienced the whole spectrum of things, you will be very, very discerning on, on exactly what you're looking for. The other part is, does that make me a better husband, right? So you might be thinking, what the hell does having a same night lay or <laughs> what does that have to yeah. do with being a better husband, okay? It has everything to do with it because if you are a guy and you have never done those things and then you go get married, you, there's always going to be this open question in mm. your mind and also in your wife's mind. So for you, it would be, so, you know, I've never done this before. Like, and then what happens if somehow that opportunity presents itself, then you would be that much more tempted to do it. And your wife, on, on her end, she would think, okay, well, he might be tempted to, to have a, a threesome or whatever because he never had it. But on the other hand, I have done so many things <laughs> in my beginner's hell that I have no, no question in my mind. I know exactly that this is the person I want to be with, and I have no yeah. interest in doing anything else. Well, some interest. <laughs> There's I, always fantasies, right? But I don't need to. Right. I, I don't have that desire. I've already been there. I've lived that life. Yeah. And, and so for both of us, it, it's, it's like it actually enhances everything because she knows I've already experienced that. I don't, I'm not curious about anything no. anymore. I just want to be with her. I think that's definitely part of that manhood is having that informed decision because you are an accomplished man. You aren't sort of looking around the fields like, can I do better? Because you went out there, you did better, and you decided you chose happiness. Because exactly. there's always going to be some woman that's, that's hotter or bigger boobs or you know, has more money, but finding that one person that completes you makes you happy, that's a decision. That's a mature decision to make make. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. Uh, another thing was that the, the choice <laughs> no. aspect. If I hadn't gone through the beginner's hell and experienced all this different variety and flavors of romantic interactions, I wouldn't be able to make a choice definitively. Like, how can you choose if you've got nothing to compare against? Mm -hmm. so. so, now that you're a husband and you're sort of looking at becoming a father, which is sort of, you know, the next stage of manhood. Like, what goes through your mind? Because to me, that just blows my mind. Like, I am not there. I don't even really know if I want to ever be a father, right? I don't know if I'm built for that, but I completely respect that choice and that life and raising someone because my boot camps, I'm already like a dad because these are like my kids and I've got to take care of them. It's just like exhausting and I only have them for the weekend, right? Like, you want to be a father. Like, what's going through your mind, like, this, this next step? Because that's, like, I haven't done that. None of your friends have done that. Well, so my wife and I have gone through multiple years of trying to figure this out. And the number that we settled on was zero to two kids. Okay, <laughs> zero to two. You're over. <laughs> so, so it actually might not, it might not be, you know, greater than zero. Right. We're not sure. But the way I see... Yeah. But you're, you're ready. Do you want to have kids? Yeah. It's a question of whether ready. she's ready. Exactly. Okay. So, so I believe my philosophy is that the husband's job is to just be ready to support whatever the girl's decision is. Mm. If my wife wants to have zero, then I support her. And we'll, trust me, we will have no problem finding other things to do. Um, and then if she wants to have one or more, then I have, I'm ready. And, and by ready, I mean in all categories, like emotionally, financially, and in terms of like, 
setting up things in our life, like our, our personal network and mm -hmm. how we're gonna deal with future challenges and things like that, all of those things have to be ready. And I guess, you know, the most important part is just your own mental state. And so I'm completely ready for that and just ready to support her. And then as far as like when it's gonna happen, I personally believe that that's the girl's decision because really she's the one going through crazy hormonal changes, <laughs> carrying nine months for nine months yeah. and then, you know, and then basically not sleeping for like a year. All right. So, I mean, that's, that's a big thing, right? Yeah. So it's like, I'm not going to force somebody to do that. I just, I'm just ready to support and whatever her decision is. You sound so mature and responsible. <laughs> oh, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, man. It's no, that's great. Like I said, you know, we go through a journey. Like you might, like you had a goal, like when you set out for this to, to get a girl, any girl, and then you accomplish that and you build up. And those goals change. Like who I am 10 years ago is different than who I am now. And same thing with my students. And I think that's part of our journey, right? And, you know, avoid being influenced by the external stimuli of the media and like the whitewashing and defining, like you're saying, you are the Asian masculine identity. You define and you choose your goals and you build up from there. Like for me, marriage, fatherhood, don't, I'm not really thinking about it, don't know if I want it, not against it, you know, but William, this is your dream, and I, that's, that's great for you, and I give you incredible props for that, I'm so honored and happy that you had me as part of your journey, not only to teach you as your instructor, but also to officiate your wedding, so. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your journey. Do um, you have any last words of advice for some young Asian boy, teenager, watching this video right now, and he's struggling with what does it mean to be an Asian man? And when he's got like all these things from the media and his friends and culture and the mainstream, like all these conflicting things, what would you say to him? Like, you know, your advice for his journey through manhood. Okay, so to be an Asian man, you gotta get everything straightened out. That's every category of your life has to be right. So that's your profession, your social circle, your volunteer and community work, and your romance life. All aspects have to be right. You have to have the skills, you have to be able to get all of these things working correctly so that way you are a complete person. If any one of these things is missing, you're just never gonna be complete, it's never gonna work. And, and I used to think that by having most of them, but not the romance part, I thought like maybe by osmosis, it would just like cover for that. <laughs> It'll automatically have happened. <laughs> but actually, it's, it's not true. And even like something as basic as like communication skills, it doesn't carry over communication skills in your, in your professional life or with your friends or with your family. It doesn't carry over into your romance life. Hmm. So back to what I was saying, to be a full Asian man, all of these aspects have to be complete. And I think for most Asian guys, the first few, like family, yeah. profession. That's like part of our culture. That, that's already covered. Mm -hmm. So if this one part is not covered, then you know who to talk to. All right. Well, you know what? Uh, thank you again uh, for coming and talking about this, this very complex subject. And absolutely let me know when you have your firstborn son. And I expect I know what his name will be. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, stay tuned for the next video. Be sure to subscribe. Um, and thank you again so much, William. Thanks. Hey there. Thanks for watching our video. I hope you liked it. And make sure you guys subscribe to this channel and watch all our other videos. Great news, too. Every Monday, we'll be putting out a new weekly video. That's right, we've got educational seminars, street interviews, uh, fun infield pickup videos, and anything else we can come up with that's fun for you guys to watch. So check back for that every Monday. Oh, and if that's not enough for you, remember that for the last 10 years, the ABCs of Attraction have been the finishing school for Asian gentlemen. So we've been teaching guys how to be better boyfriends, more confident, and better husbands. If you need that extra push, you can enroll in one of our classes. But until then, we'll see you every Monday. Bye.